What I would like to just start with is <clears throat> we've had a variety of questions submitted in advance of the dialogue this afternoon, dozens actually. Um, so we're going to start with kind of the common ones. And like I said, for those who are joining, you can feel free to add more in the chat at any time. But you know, today's event is an overview of the Canadian electricity system. And I want to start with the most basic question, which is, is there such a thing? <laughs> yeah, thanks for asking that question, Kathleen, and thanks for, for joining us today. Uh, really great to be working with you and, and again with Mars as part of the, the partnership with Spark and Bullfrog. Uh, I'd say the simple answer to your question is not really. Um, if we think about you know, a system as being something that's centrally managed and, and where decisions are made centrally about what sort of resources are going to be in it, that's not really what we have in Canada. So uh, we'll talk through today um, a little bit about province by province, in fact, how the system looks and uh, also what the interconnections are between them. So maybe we can start off just having a, a quick look at the generation in the Canadian grid. So these are all of the assets the, in these circles that are generating electricity. And, and you see that there's quite a pattern to it. Uh, so a lot of blue in some places, and that's hydroelectricity. And you see it's clustered in certain provinces. Uh, other provinces are largely black and red, so that's coal and gas that are producing electricity. And then in others, there, there's still a mix. And it, this is really uh, a bit of a continuation of the whole history of, of the electrical grid. Um, if you go back to the, the late 1800s, when we first started having centrally delivered electricity, um, in New York City, the very first electrical plant uh, was the Pearl Street Station in Manhattan. And it was owned and operated by a private company, uh, Edison Illumination Company. They only had 85 customers when they started, and they wired it up from their coal-fired plant to those customers. The first sort of long-delivered electricity was from Niagara Falls to Buffalo. And sort of the commonality is you're a private company, so what are you going to do? You're going to set up an offering that makes sense for your customer. You're going to take resources that are close at hand, and you're going to locate yourself where there are lots of customers. And so the system sort of grew up from that, that private start. And although much of it now is, is overseen by regulators, that, that sort of theme of we're going to use what's local to us uh, is still there because a lot of these assets are, are decades old because that's how long they last. I think so th there's a lot that you can sort of take away from this map here, a lot of different, you know, um, sources of generation. And I think that the historical context is certainly interesting when you think about how Canada is divided by province. Mm -hmm. there, there's a question that was submitted in advance, which I think is kind of an interesting jumping off point. Um, it was I've always believed that because we make such extensive use of hydropower in Canada, and you do see a lot of that on this map here, our electric grid contributes a lot less to, to greenhouse gas emissions than it does in other Western countries. And so, you know, looking at that map, I think that that's a fairly safe assumption to make. It, is that accurate? Uh, the answer is it depends. Uh, it, it gets back to this theme of it really is a provincially driven system and not a federally driven system. So let's compare two sets of provinces and compare and contrast them. So here are the higher carbon grids across the country. And so you see a lot of that red and black that we saw on the Canadian map, the black being coal and the red being gas. So if you're in Alberta or you're in Saskatchewan or you're in Nova Scotia in particular, um, if we look at the actual grams of carbon dioxide equivalent per kilowatt hour, these numbers don't mean a lot to you unless you've got something to compare them to, but these numbers would be similar to what you would see in India, in many parts of China, in terms of the carbon intensity of the grid. Uh, now, this is changing over time. You are starting to see some of the green, for example, for wind coming into place, and there's more to come on that. Uh, but certainly today, these provinces would not be on a global scale uh, a low carbon solution. Um, so the average across the world, just to put these numbers in context, is 475 uh, in 2018, which is where this data is from. So you know, Alberta has committed to phasing out coal in the next 10 years. So by 2030, all that black will go away. Uh, Saskatchewan has been procuring wind. They did a 300 megawatt procurement in March. 
and they have a goal for 2030 as well to be half renewable. Um, their main utility, they only have one major utility, SAS Power has a 40% greenhouse gas reduction goal. So we're going to get better on that over time, but as we stand today, uh, not really. Mm. So I think that's, that's incredibly disconcerting when you look at the, the averages and the benchmark. Um, you know, you talked a little bit about Alberta and where they're going. What does this look like for other provinces? Are there kind of more provincial options for renewable power on the on the on the horizon, I guess, or is this something that is within the provincial plans? And and what what can we look to in terms of transitioning to a lower carbon um, economy? Yeah, we we did have um, some questions come in about whether there'd be you know another rep program that was the auction name in in Alberta uh, in recent years. And uh, there won't be that type of auction in Alberta, but actually there doesn't need to be. This is actually the, the flip side of the Alberta story, and it, it's actually a great opportunity uh, because Alberta is the one province in Canada where the electricity system is deregulated. And what that means is that it isn't a provincial body that's dictating where and when and how much and what type of generation is going to be built, other than the fact that they've said there won't be any more coal in the system by 2030. But beyond that, uh, if you can get the proper environmental permitting in place and uh, get the financing to build a new energy generation asset in Alberta, uh, you can go ahead and do that. And, and that's really what underlies the agreement that many of the folks uh, joining us today will have seen in the news about a month ago, where Bullfrog has signed a power purchase agreement to uh, buy the energy off of two new utility scale solar farms in Alberta. They were being purpose built and will go live in April of next year. And so that, that's gonna grow uh, the, the yellow slice that we don't even really see there. And so really um, people can vote with their dollars in Alberta and if people want to see that coal replaced with renewables um, then through organizations like ours or other large companies that are making commitments to do that, that will start to transition more to renewables, uh, just purely people voting with their dollars. Mm. Saskatchewan uh, has had um, some um, auctions or, or RFPs really, requests for proposal. I think they're continuing to do so to meet those goals. Um, so we're going to see movement on it, but Alberta is probably the biggest opportunity just because um, there is the opportunity for people who have the, the desire and the wherewithal to get a project built to, to start to impact on this on their own. Mm. So, I mean, this, this slide shows a pretty, a pretty grim picture of today. There's some hope on the horizon, but you know, there must be a number of provinces that are actually well below average. If these, these four are well above, are those the ones with um, the majority of their generation in hydro? Oh, here we go. Here you go. You nailed it. So uh, a lot of blue on this slide. Uh, for water. So when you look across from British Columbia all the way to Newfoundland, uh, there are four provinces that are above 90% large hydro in their mix. And so when you look at the, the grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour, remember the number for Saskatchewan, Nova Scotia, and Alberta was in the 600s and 700s, and Manitoba is one, and Quebec is two. So uh, a huge spread in terms of, of the GHGs. Uh, between those provinces. So, you know, we've talked about a, a little bit about the, the provincial divide and the fact that this really is province specific. Um, how far are we from having a national electrical grid? Is this something that we're, we're talking about? Um, are these disparities something that we're bridging the gap between? Or, you know, as you said, is Alberta kind of what we're looking to transition um, ahead of others? What, what does that look like at a more national level? Right, so there has been conversation certainly and proposals to try to create, for example, a you know, national energy corridor that would include uh, transmission um, on high voltage across provinces, but we're pretty limited uh, in that today. And maybe we'll walk through these provinces to sort of show what the actual capability is and the actual sales today uh, of these. Because if, if we were closer to having all that uh, infrastructure in place, then Manitoba, for example, with a carbon intensity of one could export to Saskatchewan with a carbon intensity of 700 and, and kind of fix the problem quite quickly. Or Quebec could supply New Brunswick uh, in the same way. 
interestingly though, th there is a lot of trade in electricity. Um, it's just not, uh, not always uh, east-west. And so we'll talk to that a little bit as well. One, one interesting thing I'll point out before we start looking at, at each of these provinces in turn, if you look at the, the numbers in the center of, of these pie charts, so that's the actual number of terawatt hours that are produced. Again, if you don't have a lot of context for that, it, it's hard to, hard to interpret it, but maybe we can speak to it just for a moment. So British Columbia on the left is, is largely balanced in how much it produces and how much it consumes. So if we take BC as kind of a benchmark, if you will, um, so you look at Manitoba, and Manitoba has about a quarter of the population of BC, but produces about half as much electricity. So that would point to they're exporting it somewhere, right? It's not all being used in province. Uh, Quebec, similarly, um, has about double uh, the population of BC, not even double, actually, about 60% more, but they're producing almost three times as much power. And then Newfoundland, uh, as you see, has a very small population, but produces a substantial amount of electricity as, as much as Manitoba does, with only about half a million people. So, so there's some interesting stuff going on behind this, uh, the surface here, and maybe we can delve into that a little bit. Yeah, that sounds good. I think it, it would be interesting to kind of dive into province by province and, and this intra-provincial connectivity is a is something that that I would appreciate clarification on. I think many in the room have asked these questions in advance as well. Okay, so let's start with Manitoba then. Sure. And so this is showing uh, the interconnections that exist in terms of the capacity that can be sent at any given moment out of the province of Manitoba. And so you see You've got 150 megawatts going west to Saskatchewan, 200 megawatts going east to Ontario, and then more than 10 times that amount uh, going south into Minnesota. And so you, you look at that and say, well, if we, can, if we can do that, like why aren't we doing it across Canada instead of sending it north-south? But it gets back to this concept of, these are really provincially run systems. And so each province is going to make a decision on what it's going to do with its electrical generation that best suits what it perceives to be the needs and the interest of its own population at that time. And so when you, when you look at this map, um, the one thing that kind of stands out is there are only two big cities on this map. Winnipeg is one of them and Minneapolis is the other. And in fact, uh, Minneapolis has almost as many people as the entire rest of the map put together. And they also have uh, a relatively high carbon grid and they have goals to reduce that carbon footprint. So basically, they're a good customer for Manitoba. They are willing to pay what it takes to get that power in, uh, to invest in the infrastructure, to transmit that power down to the population centers. And those population centers are a lot closer than they would be if, for example, you're trying to send this power all the way to Southern Ontario. So sort of a, uh, it speaks to the, the sort of what drives decision making is not really necessarily a, a national interest. There isn't a national regulator who's saying, let's make an interconnected grid. It's really the province making the decision on what makes economic sense for that province at a given point in time. I think we had, Kathleen, do we have a question about tariffs on electricity since we're talking about going cross border? Yeah. So. Yeah, so how then we do, um, how, how does that work? The question is, are tariffs charged for interprovincial transfers? Um, and if so, who charges them? Is it, you know, kind of going back to your, um, your point that this, these decisions are made on a provincial level, is that where the decisions are made or is there more of a national oversight over tariffs? Yeah, there isn't a tariff uh, in the meaning of a tax on trade. The, the word tariff has a different meaning in the electrical industry. It kind of means what the rate structure look like. So that's what your, your utility will file, what they call a tariff to the regulator in your province. But when it comes to, do we have a tax when you send electricity across the border? No, there's just a negotiated price between Manitoba and Minnesota or the utilities in this case. Um, and you know, neither, neither party would have any interest in taxing the other on that transaction. Um, One quick point of clarification on that. When we look at the yeah. map, and this is from the chat actually, so when we look at the map, are the arrows unidirectional flow or is it actually bi-directional? Yeah, so electricity flows bi-directionally for sure. So you could go either way. And in fact, that does happen quite a bit. When you look at the 
the data that's published by each province's system operator, you will see bi-directional. In fact, when we get to the BC uh, slide, a couple of slides from now, you'll actually see a fair bit of, of, of bi-directional trade going on. Great, and then kind of going back to your point, that bi-directionality, it's, it's not an additional tariff, it's those provinces are negotiating on price. Both that's ways. right, that's right. And actually, maybe an interesting anecdote for, for everybody on the call about that bi-directionality. So Minnesota also has a supply agreement with North Dakota. So the utility in Minnesota actually buys wind power from North Dakota because when North Dakota is very windy, it's a very good place to build wind. And that wind power is produced when it's produced, when it's windy. And so it doesn't always perfectly match the consumption of electricity. And you can build a battery to deal with that. We'll talk about batteries later in this in the session. But uh, if you've got hydro that's behind a, a dam, we've got a reservoir, um, you can also use that to balance. And so really what happens uh, in the situation is there's an agreement between Minnesota and, and Manitoba to say, when we're getting a lot of wind from North Dakota, uh, we're going to basically ask you to hold back on sending us hydro. We may even send some of that wind power up to you and use the hydro in Manitoba as, as kind of a giant battery. So that, that's actually another question that, that has come up while we're on the topic. So when you think about you know, the balancing that you just mentioned and how complex that is, you can never have kind of an overabundance or surplus. It has to be, at all points, the system has to be perfectly balanced. Right. How much energy storage do we currently have to do that? Whether that be battery storage um, or reservoir hydro, as you mentioned. So if we counted reservoir hydro as, as storage, we've got lots. Um, but I said kind of like a battery, and, and that was purposeful um, in those words, because when you think about how it works, you can't really send the power back up uh, to the top of the dam and into the reservoir, right? So it's not really storing generation that might be made by wind. What you're doing is holding back at the times when you don't need to produce it. So it's more like a supply balancing asset like gas plants do in many other systems. And we'll, we'll look at Ontario in that vein later on. Um, there is actually only one operating pumped hydro storage in Canada that actually does pump the hot pump water you know, up to a higher level and then be able to run turbine when it lets it back down. That's in Niagara. And that's 174 megawatts. So you, you compare it to the numbers on this map and you see that it's not even as much as, as the exports in uh, between Manitoba and Ontario, for example. There is another one in development. TC Energy is uh, trying to build a one gigawatt uh, pumped hydro facility in, on Georgian Bay. But that's not without controversy uh, because like when you build large hydro, you're now you know, flooding land that wasn't flooded before. So um, there isn't a lot and uh, it's not easy to get it built. Um, so where, where the trend is, is uh, much of the growth is, is in actual batteries. These are lithium ion batteries, uh, like you'd see in an electric car, car sorry, or, or in your computer. But um, those actually aren't really a grid asset per se. The, the regulators, the people who are running the grids, um, they're not in control of them. They're usually owned by private companies. So the company puts a big battery beside their factory and they use that to manage, are they buying high priced electricity or low priced electricity and they charge their battery at the right time and discharge it at the right time to manage that. So they're not really part of what, what we would consider the, the grid, at least not controllable by the grid today. So we've got enough reservoir hydro to act as a balancing resource for 100% renewable grid, but today we're using it as our base load um, to actually, you know, supply base power to to our consumers. So without building a lot more redundant capacity, um, you can't really use that reservoir hydro as as quote unquote storage or a battery. Right. It has limitations just based on on the fa fact that water flows based on gravity. <laughs> it, it does that. <laughs> so. You, you showed on the previous slide, Quebec's number is huge, right? In terms mm -hmm. of what, what they generate. And you talked a little bit about the disproportionate, um, it's disproportionate with the size of the population. Right. So is it the same story you've kind of talked about bi-directional flow? What does that look like for Quebec? Yeah, it's, it's similar. Uh, so let's have a look at, at Quebec and where they're sending electricity. So um, 
the exports aren't as large as you might think, given that they were way over 200 terawatt hours of, of generation and they've only got about 60% more population than BC. You might expect them to be, you know, exporting maybe 100. Uh, the fact is, hydropower is so cheap and so prevalent in Quebec that a lot of things that are run on gas in other provinces, like heat, are often electrified in Quebec. And so Quebec uses a lot of that power in province. That said, uh, they still do export 36 terawatt hours, which is as much as Manitoba produces for its own use and export combined over the course of a year. So it's, it's a very large exporter of power. As you can see, though, uh, three quarters of that power is actually going south. And it's, it's the same concept. So you've got people in New England and in New York uh, who are uh, actually paying a lot more for power than people in Ontario are. We, we've um, had a lot of, of controversy about the price of electricity in Ontario over the last few years, and it has gone up. But when you compare it to what it costs to uh, pay your electricity bill in Toronto versus what it costs in Boston or in New York City, it's actually a lot more expensive south of the border. And so there's a lot of demand for competitively priced uh, electricity from Quebec. And uh, there are significant carbon reduction goals in those areas as well. And that this helps them with that. So um, with that, we get much more north-south flow than we get east-west flow, although as you see, there is a pretty substantial Ontario-Quebec amount as well. So what is the reason for greater north-south flow? Is it is it as simple as, you know, there's, there's higher prices that we can get for the power from the United States um, and greater demand, or, or, or what does that equation kind of look like? Yeah, that, that's certainly the key driver, right? That's, that's the number one factor. Um, but you, you might, in other circumstances, especially if you had a national sort of body, think maybe there's a hometown discount, right, for, for your neighboring province. Um, but interprovincial trade in electricity hasn't always been uh, as seamless as, as you might like. And, and that's actually kind of the story of Newfoundland. So um, Churchill Falls pictured here. So you've got a picture from before it was turned into a very large hydroelectric plant. And then a picture for what it looks like afterwards, because the the actual generators are buried in that granite, uh, so the water is going down, producing hydroelectricity, and then uh, the flow is being controlled, and you have much less flow coming out at, at the bottom. So this is a, a huge facility. Uh, at the time it was built, it was the second largest hydro plant in the world, and I think it's still in the top ten. And uh, it's been a decades-long controversy. Um, because the pricing that was negotiated uh, was very, very low. Um, it was uh, 2.2 cents per kilowatt hour. So you know, your bill at home, uh, or if you're running a business, is probably somewhere between uh, 10 and 13 cents a kilowatt hour typically delivered. So you can see that's, that's an incredibly low price. And not only that, it's a 75 year agreement. So it, it started in, in 1976 and it's going to 2041. Uh, and there have been lawsuits that have gone all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada about this. The last one was just in 2018. Um, the Supreme Court sided with Quebec and said it was a valid deal. But that doesn't mean it's not a sore point uh, for generations of, of Newfoundlanders. So um, when you're looking at making a massive capital investment to transport electricity from one province to another, and, and there isn't a great history, and there's some other examples in the same vein, um, the, the hometown discount isn't necessarily going to be applied. So I think this is a really interesting question to perhaps pause on for a moment, which is um, as we, we, we read about the shift, right, from a centralized grid to a decentralized grid, and yet in some instances, large capital investments are, st are still being made. Um, what's, what does that shift look like? Are there still large energy projects like this one? I know you're kind of talking historically, but uh, underway, and, and, or are we shifting really more to a decentralized system? Yeah, there's both for sure. And I think as we look forward, it's going to be a balance. But I think the pattern that we're seeing, or at least the trend that we're seeing, is moving more towards that decentralized uh, both generation and storage of electricity. If we look at, for example, the Site C project uh, in BC um, or the Muskrat Falls project in Newfoundland, um, those have been fraught with difficulty. It's very hard to get very, very large projects built, especially hydro projects that have 
uh, significant impacts on the surrounding environment. They have a lot of capital behind them and they're very, very long timelines to get them built and have a history of coming in over budget. And uh, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, you can build solar power, for example, in a matter of months if you want to and build it at small scale and have that privately financed. So there certainly is grid scale uh, construction going on and there will continue to be provinces and their electricity operators are continuing to put out calls to build uh, new capacity of especially wind and solar. But uh, on a global scale, we're seeing the cost of wind and solar come down and that's really helping the decentralization. So, okay, so let's maybe pick up on that for a second. One of the questions that I, I loved that was submitted in advance is, you know, when you, when you think about renewables, when you think about, let's just take wind and solar for, um, for the time being, on a global scale, is, is it really making a difference? So right. say we are making a shift from large capital intensive projects into these smaller, more modular, as you said, privately financed types of right. renewables. Um, yeah. But yet, you know, kind of we're sitting in our EVs and we're sitting behind an, I like this, an oil belching pickup truck, wondering if we're making any difference at all. <laughs> right. Yeah, I laughed when I saw that question as well. Yeah, maybe I'll, we'll, we'll come back to BC. We'll talk about that in a moment. But maybe that's really, I think, that's leading us to talk about Ontario. And, and is it making a difference? And I think the answer is unequivocally yes. Um, if you look at uh, where we were 15 years ago or so uh, in Ontario, where quarter of the electricity was produced by coal. And so our um, carbon emissions in Ontario were equivalent to where New Brunswick is today, so a little over 300. And now we've moved entirely off of coal. And while a lot of that has been the increase in nuclear, so we had refurbishment of, of the Bruce Power facilities on Lake Huron, uh, you see that from basically no wind and solar at that time. We have substantial wind and solar uh, today, and, and that was critical to making it happen as well. So um, if you are driving that, that electric vehicle uh, in, in Ontario today, uh, in 2003, it still would have been better than driving a gasoline car, but, but not a lot better. And today, that, that car is running on mostly clean electricity, so it, it definitely is making a difference, and I, I, there's a 90% reduction in greenhouse gases, which was the equivalent of taking 7 million cars off the road. So to connect it to that, that analogy of sitting behind the truck, uh, you, just, you took 7 million trucks off the road uh, by making this change in the Ontario system. Very interesting. I love, there's a quote I, I read recently that not this car, but our next car will be electric in, in our <laughs> uh, Ontario right. communities. So I think that's an impact that we're certainly seeing scale exponentially over time. Uh, totally agree, and that's maybe a whole other webinar we could have, and maybe we'll, we'll set that one up next. <laughs> Sounds good. So let's maybe go back to BC for a moment. I know I, I skipped right to, you know, are we making a difference? But, that's good. you know, if this, is the, if this is a story in Ontario, what does it look like in BC? I know we always hear about the east-west divide, and, and um, in Canada, that's obviously something that's at play. But what are we working with in BC? Yeah, BC is an interesting story because you know, we saw the initial graph that said BC is well over 90% hydro. Um, that's what it generates. It's not necessarily what it consumes, though. And I'm not sure that's something that everybody in BC realizes. So if we look at the trade flows, and this is talking about bi-directional um, electricity, BC is sending a reasonably substantial amount of electricity to Alberta, also taking some back. And, and it's you know labeled um, as, as black on the way back, because as we saw earlier, Alberta's power is you know, a mixture of largely coal and gas, and similarly sending a lot of power down to the US, but importing uh, even more than it's exporting, and uh, getting that from Washington, Oregon, California, which have grids that are 25 to 50% fossil fuels. So when you look at what the actual carbon footprint is of what's consumed in BC, it may not actually be you know, what's reported from the generation. Um, so BC is exporting 17% of its power. Uh, you've, you've almost got to, you know, if you want to be honest, add it back um, to what the carbon footprint is in, in British Columbia. That's interesting. I think it's, you know, as we as we think about our system provincially, 
these calculations don't necessarily come into mind in terms of where is it coming from and what is the interprovincial relationship look like and so therefore how clean is it really yeah it's a good question and you know so obviously people in bc would still say yeah we're, we're mostly hydro the, the title a little cheeky maybe on, on the previous slide was was don't call it hydro because even in in government legislation people call electricity hydro in in ontario right and you know, at one point in history when Niagara Falls was the big generator, that, that made sense. We still have companies called Toronto Hydro. Um, you could probably argue that they should call themselves Toronto Nuclear uh, if you look at this graph. So um, <laughs> where does Toronto get its electricity? So I mean, we've kind of gone from the national to the provincial, but here I am sitting in downtown Toronto. Um, how much of what I'm consuming is renewable? What does that picture look like? Yeah, so maybe we should clarify first that um, Toronto Hydro uh, doesn't contract independently for who's going to supply its power. Uh, it, like every other distribution company in the province, takes what the mix is provincially, and that is really governed on a provincial level by the IESO in Ontario. And you actually can't really answer at that point exactly where Toronto gets its electricity, uh, because you can't track the flow of an individual electron and say that whatever ended up in your toaster or your light came from Pickering or came from hydro in the north or came from a gas plant. Um, but you know, so as, as a non-electrical engineer, I've, I've had to get up to speed on, on electricity a little bit and, and had it explained to me like I'm a five-year-old. And so maybe I'll, I'll sort of share my layman's um, analogy with you that was shared with me, which is that you can use water as a pretty good analogy for electricity. And we use the word current for both, right? So if water goes into the system uh, in Eastern Ontario and some water goes into the system in Northern Ontario, you, you can't say, you know, let's send these molecules of water to Toronto uh, and let's send these to Ottawa. Um, they're going to flow to wherever, in water's case, the low point is, and in electricity's case, they're going to flow to wherever there's load, wherever there's something that's ready to consume that electricity. So it really depends on uh, what's being generated at any particular point in time and what's being consumed at any particular point in time, where those electrons are, are going to flow. But one thing you can say as a basic principle is that if there's a load near where it's being generated, that's what's going to take that electricity. So, you know, if we look at, at a map of Ontario, and this is a bit of a zoom in of, of the national map that we had at the very beginning. So you've got um, in the very north of the province, some hydro facilities and Niagara Falls, you can still see the big blue circle there. You've got a lot of wind in southwestern Ontario, those are the little green dots. Uh, you've got three big nuclear plants in Pickering and Darlington and King Carden. And then you've got a lot of red, which is gas plants. So in some hours, uh, when Pickering is producing, it's right beside Toronto and Toronto's consuming electricity. It would make sense to conclude, but probably a lot of electricity that's flowing in Toronto is coming from Pickering. But that really changes by, by time of day. So maybe I can, I can leap into this one, Kathleen, because uh, I think this is super interesting and also not something everybody um, has a great handle on. Okay. So we. One of the things uh, about the, the electricity mix in Ontario is that it's, it's kind of dominated by things that uh, you can't really control in addition to wind and solar. We always hear about wind and solar and they're going to produce when the wind's blowing or the sun's shining. Uh, but, but nuclear um, almost has the opposite problem. It's not that you can't turn it on, it's that you can't turn it off, actually. And um, if you've been to Niagara Falls, you also realize there isn't a dam behind Niagara Falls. So we can't really shut that off either. And so you have a lot of baseload power in Ontario, and that's that nuclear is that very constant uh, orange bar that you see along the bottom of this. And this is data uh, directly from the IESO, the system operator in Ontario. You can go onto their website and you can pull this every hour if you want to. And uh, you see the hydro, which is the, the light blue in this graph. And so it's moving up and down because there is some reservoir hydro in Ontario, but you've got a kind of a baseload with Niagara as well. And so when you look at hot days, uh, like we've had recently, so this is from the 20th to the 25th of August, just in the last week or so, what you've got in many hours is that dark blue going up and down, which is gas. These are natural gas plants, which are completely controllable. 
Uh, they can be turned on and off very quickly. And so that's, that's sort of the balancing um, asset in, in the system. So when you ask where does, on, where does Toronto get its electricity or even take it up to where does Ontario get its electricity, we saw an annual average in that pie chart at the beginning. But depending on what hour you're talking about, it could be basically 100% renewable, as you see in the overnight hours on, on many of these, where you've got, um, you've got well, at least 100% is your carbon, uh, where you've got wind blowing and you've got no gas in some cases. And then in other cases, like we look at that, that five o'clock hour this past Monday, and gas is producing uh, 25, 30%. And in some cases, you'll see it get up to 40% of the electricity in a given hour in Ontario is actually being produced by natural gas plants. This is a really interesting, and obviously, I like that you you know you selected dates that were recent because I think we can all kind of think about the extreme heat that we've been facing. But right. one of the uh, Sean, as you know, one of the the projects that we've been working on at Mars is in New York State, and specifically with Niagara Falls. And one of the things that we've been learning is that when you look at that light blue line, which is actually relatively flat on this graph, mm -hmm. over time, as you look at, at the scenarios. Um, that we may be facing with extreme weather and climate change impacting our communities more severely, that line actually becomes quite more lumpy. It's it's almost looks a little bit like this graph, right, where it's mm. um, it peaks and valleys. What does that mean in terms of the importance of, say, gas, solar, wind, those other alternative um, types of generation, or even nuclear as your base load? How does that that shift over time from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I, I think what you're what you're pointing out is that um, that the power system is not only a um, determiner of climate change, but it is also impacted by by climate change, right? And so when you have huge rainstorms and then and then droughts, and there's only so much space behind the dam, even if you have reservoir hydro, and some of it's run a river as well, so it runs when when it's raining or when there's enough water you can get huge variability. In fact, California, some of what they've been experiencing in the last few years has been because of this, this sort of drought cycle they've been going through. And so they haven't had that base load of hydro from melting uh, snowpack that they normally would have. So I, I think it all points, Kathleen, to there being no one solution to the future grid, that it is going to be geographically dependent, but you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket because there are pluses and minuses to every kind of generation. And if, if you're 100% large hydro, that has worked well to this point for many places, but you do need to be thinking about diversity of sources going forward as well. And with the, the cost decreases that we've seen in wind and hydro, those are becoming increasingly uh, viable options, um, not only environmentally, but economically for, for the grid operators to use. So on, on this last Point. Something that I just want to pick up on from the chat is on this this comment about economically. So, mm -hmm. how widely do electricity costs vary with time um, on an hourly basis due to demand and availability? Obviously, driven by those kind of macroeconomic factors. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, well, it really depends on where you are because there, in most parts of Canada, there isn't really a wholesale electricity market to to quote from, but. A couple that you can talk about are in Alberta and in Ontario. Um, in Ontario's case, most of the generation is actually contracted. There's a guaranteed price to the generator. And that's been some of the controversy that, that we hear in, in the political sphere about how we should resource the electrical system. But whether you're building a nuclear plant that has multi-decades life and costs billions of dollars, whether you're building a gas plant that's going to sit around 95% of the year and not produce, uh, you, you kind of need that, you know, that guaranteed payment. In Alberta, it's completely the opposite. And that's where you see huge volatility in power prices, where it's completely a supply-demand system. So at any given hour, however much demand there is for electricity and however much supply there is, and what the people bid in who are supplying it basically determines the price. And there are hours when the price of electricity is essentially zero uh, in Alberta. And there are hours when it's a dollar a kilowatt hour, which is a thousand dollars a megawatt hour. So, you know, a hundred times what it normally would be. So huge volatility, um, obviously in the system operator's uh, best interest to try to control that. And that's where storage will come in over time to try to tamp that down. But we do see large variability in, in wholesale power markets whenever it is a market-driven system like we have in Alberta, 
we see it in Texas and other places as well. Right, so I think my one takeaway there listening to that is that flexibility is paramount to manage volatility. And that might come from energy storage, it might come from diversity of, of sources of generation. There's a variety of ways you can make that happen. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Got it, okay. So let's just go back to a second to the mix of sources in the grid overall. I think we've kind of gone down the this yeah. path a little bit, but um, one of the questions that was submitted was how are electricity generation contracts negotiated? Um, and how is it determined how much will be generated by renewables? Right. So, you know, you've talked about volatility in the system and the need for flexibility, but how do you actually determine 7% will come from wind, for instance? Right, right. Um, so the system operator wouldn't determine necessarily the 7% will come from wind on any given hour because as you see on this chart that that's really determined by what the system need is and what's available. But in terms of the capacity of the system, that's where there is a contract to be signed and maybe we can have a look at what the future looks like in Ontario because um, there is a specific plan in place uh, from the system operator to uh, first of all retire the Pickering nuclear plant and um, and then to replace most of the necessary generation from when that's being retired, but also when the other two plants are being refurbished with gas. And so you see gas in this case is the kind of teal or, or green bar and goes from pretty narrow uh, today to quite wide over time. And so that is that is a decision that is made uh, by the system operator. They're taking into account uh, their mandate of reliability of cost of quality of power to do that. Um, but it has, it's gonna have pretty significant impacts um, in Ontario. I mean, if you look at the greenhouse gases, so we, we had that 90% reduction we spoke to earlier. So this is a chart of, of greenhouse gases from electricity generation in Ontario. And now we're at the point where we're talking about ramping gas back up and depending on how much you need, because there's a, a fairly wide dispersion of how much you might need depending on how much we electrify vehicles or how much we electrify industry or how much energy efficiency we have that you could end up with three to five times the greenhouse gases that we have today by 2030 or 2035 in Ontario. So I mean it looks like in some instances there is a risk and correct me if I'm wrong here but there is a risk of gas or nuclear, other base load sources of generation, um, needing requiring us to curtail the use of renewables. Is that is that correct? What does that look like in terms of um, balancing the system? Yeah, it happens today for sure, um, that we are sometimes curtailing wind at night because in Ontario you've got excess generation at night in, in many cases. That's where, uh, you know, in the future storage is going to play such an important role and um, where it's fortunate that we're starting to see the cost of storage come way down, which I think we'll, we'll speak to, you know, in a couple of slides. Maybe can we talk just for a moment as we look at this about um, about that that demand profile and how much we may have to curtail versus how much we might have to build out. Um, yeah. When you look at this this graph here, so this is again from the ISO, and this is their forecasting, and they've got a base case and a high case and a low case. And you see there's a 25% difference in how much electricity that we need um, between one to the other. And so while, to your point, Kathleen, um, managing that inter intermittency of renewables is one issue. Also managing how much base load you've got um, and not having too much base load power at any given time is also very critical. And so if you think about trying to plan the electrical system in Ontario, um, if you're going to build out assets that take a decade to build, um, you've got to take into account that you actually don't know how much electricity you're going to need at that point in time, but there's a huge amount of uncertainty about that. And the real benefit of renewables is that they are so scalable, solar in particular hugely, but even wind, to the point where you can almost build them at the time that you need them. It only takes you know months in some cases to get it built. And so you can, as opposed to trying to use your crystal ball and forecast exactly how much you're gonna need in 2030, uh, you can actually be more responsive and, and track what the trends are in electricity consumption over time. So what does that look like in terms of when we think about, you mentioned Pickering retiring, for instance, or 
the, uh, the Bruce Power refurbishments as well. Um, what does that look like? Are we, sh are we starting to shift that profile to more flexible renewables? At this point, the, the plan would not necessarily be to do that. It looks like the plan is for gas, but um, you know, we're entering an interesting, interesting time. Uh, we talked at the very beginning about the fact that, that, that the origins of the electrical system, that it was really private actors uh, at a very micro scale who were building the assets, right? So the Edison Illumination Company said, I'm going to give lighting to 85 people and they, and they built a plant to do that. And, and now we're starting to move into a time where um, it's, it's almost flowing back to that, that decentralization that we started with, a, a bit of back to the future. Um, I mean, if we look here, uh, you're starting to see that even on a grid scale, uh, storage is starting to be used quite massively. Um, so these are you know, grid operators and they're coming out and saying things like, there may be another peak or gas plant built in the US after this year. NextEra is one of the largest utilities in the world saying that based in Florida. Um, just two days ago, we had Puerto Rico basically saying, no, utility don't build more gas plants you know go and build solar plus storage because storage it makes sense now uh, we have developers saying that they can build solar and storage to mimic what a gas plant would do at half the cost so at a, a utility scale we're starting to see that but i think the really interesting point that connects to your question is it's more of a distributed resource der standing for distributed energy resource and so this is where uh, you as particularly as a business owner today, not really on the residential scale yet in, in Canada, but certainly on the business scale can say, we don't necessarily have to accept what the mix in the grid is. Uh, you've always had the choice through Bullfrog, for example, to say, you know, we'll contract for assets through the grid that are renewable and we'll buy 100% renewable power. Uh, what's emerging is that you've got more options to do that sort of physically on your own premises as well. And it's an area that we're, we're very quickly moving into um, as part of the Spark organization. So um, today you've got batteries like we see pictured here, which are sitting beside an industrial facility. They're storing energy. They're allowing the person who's running that facility not only to control their costs, but also their supply in terms of maybe taking hydro at night and discharging when gas would be running during the day. Right. Where it's moving towards though, is we see a, an electric vehicle plugged into this B2G machine, that's vehicle to grid. And so it's not unidirectional either anymore where you're just charging your EV. That, that EV is a giant rolling battery and they keep getting bigger every year, right? Because we get more range on, on cars. And so in fact, if, if you kind of do the math, um, on, on EVs, if we got to three and a half percent penetration of EVs, uh, sorry, if we got to 1.7 percent penetration of EVs, um, you would have more batteries rolling around in cars just in Canada than, than there is grid scale battery storage in the world today. Um, so it's really EVs that are driving the cost on, on batteries down. And EVs are already three and a half percent of vehicle sales in Canada. That was the three and a half percent that I meant to speak to. So it's, it's not that far off uh, that we're going to be looking at having very substantial assets in the hands of consumers. And it's really the question is going to be, how do you integrate those? How, if you're the system operator, do you even get visibility to what's there? And how do you work with private companies who are going to be able to dispatch these assets for you? be able to price them for you and give you visibility to what's going on. So we're seeing, I think this is, it's very empowering what you're saying, right? The, the ability for customers and others to, to start to take some control over what the mix looks like and the fact that decentralization may empower customers to do that. Mm -hmm. um, we saw, you know, in some of the graphs that you showed that Wind and Sun produce power on their own schedule though. Right. It's, it's sort of, it, the flexibility is both the benefit and the risk. Um, so how feasible is it really to increase renewables significantly? And what, what is the, the role of, of other um, forms of generation like gas and nuclear? Mm -hmm. So you know, there, as we're transitioning and we've got uh, 10 years basically to hit the IPCC's guideline of, of a 50% reduction in um, greenhouse gases, if we're going to stay within a degree and a half, ideally, or at a minimum two degrees uh, of warning, that, you know, we've got to move quickly. 
And so and you've got to move quickly towards non-emitting resources. Um, and given what we've got in Canada, I, I don't know if there's anywhere in the world that's better positioned to get to 100% renewable grid, uh, given that we do have so much baseload hydro that can also be flexible, uh, and that we're a developed country where things like this technology uh, is really coming to fruition. So it's there, uh, the, the opportunity is there. The question is, uh, you know, how do we get alignment on, on actually going after it? One of the other pieces, and maybe I'll, this is the last piece for, for the DERs, is the cost of generating your own solar has really come down. And so if you look at, a, at an industrial facility like this, the amount of space they've got on their roof, um, in most cases, will support a solar system that can supply a quarter or so of the electricity. If it's a warehouse, you can actually supply 100% of the electricity because there's not a lot of machinery in there. But in a manufacturing facility, um, you, you can start to, again, build out at a, at a relatively small scale, very distributed renewables that doesn't necessarily take the regulator to do it, that the customer is going to do because it's actually cheaper to generate your own electricity and consume it yourself uh, than it is to buy it from the grid. And, and they're essentially using the grid as, as the battery in that case where they're consuming their own power first and, um, and using the grid power when needed. This isn't really... Um, all that feasible at a residential scale in Canada yet. The, the chart on the left side would say, you know, if you're looking at the blue line, which is the scale of most residential systems in Canada, it's come down 25% or so in the last five years. Uh, but at $4 a watt, um, you're, you're not really going to be competitive with the power that you can buy from your utility. If you've got a bit of a bigger house and maybe you're on the green line and uh, you have a tree in front and you've got a big south facing roof, it can work in some cases. But generally when we're looking at facilities like we see in this photo, that's the yellow line. And those have come down from just under $3 to under $1.50. So they come down by 50% in the last five years to the point where it's, it's now very competitive if you've got the right roof. So, for homeowners looking to convert to renewable energy, how do they how do they do that economically, or what questions should they be asking? I think you you've mentioned geographic placement, you know, um, resolution to the sun. What, what else is is kind of um, required in order to move to that to that uh, renewable generation? Yeah, I, I think today, to be honest, Kathleen, your your best bet is is to work with somebody like Bullfrog to do that because you're going to take advantage of the yellow line, or in fact, a whole line below that, which is building at an even larger scale that that we can we can capture the economies of scale of. Um, but you know, if if you want to test it out, there are people out there who will will cost it out for you. I did it. I did it for my own house. I live in a small house in a central location with. Uh, with the roof that faces the wrong way and it was going to cost me 31 and a half cents a kilowatt hour to produce my own power so um, i'm still a very happy bullfrog customer um, but you know we're going to see that move over time and and may even be in new communities are starting to build microgrids and and more generation on the scale of maybe where this yellow line is maybe kathleen it, DERs, this is this is an uh, area I know Mars is really into. Uh, and so can can I flip roles with you here for a minute? Can I can I start asking you some questions? Uh, sure, yeah, that sounds good. So I, I know Mars, like, Mars works with folks like this. Tell, tell us a little bit about what's going on in the Mars space. Sure, so um, I guess just a little bit of context and, and thank you for having me today. This has been a really fascinating discussion and always good to get, to get more insight and refreshers. Um, in my role at the Mars Discovery District, we work with over 1400 ventures. So these are emerging technology companies. They range in maturity in terms of the technology. Some are under a million dollars in revenue and others are set to be a hundred million dollars in revenue over the next five years. And they're all Canadian leading the sector. So maybe in our last couple of minutes here, I'll, I'll maybe just reflect on the three that are starting to transform the system from a management standpoint. And all three of these are leveraging artificial intelligence to do this. And I think it's kind of interesting, Sean, going back to your question and point around empowering customers. That's what mm. some of these technologies are starting to do. Um, so yeah, maybe if, if you'll indulge me, I'll just quickly name three. Yeah, you're, you're off. Okay. 
So Canvas Analytics, uh, the first one is an AI industrial advanced analytics platform. So intelligent operations, it uses um, the Internet of Things. So essentially the placement of sensors across a plant or facility, something like an automotive manufacturer or metals and mining or food and agri agriculture um, to sense um, data, but not only historical data to actually predict what will the performance of that plant look like over time. And in doing that, it enables those industries to um, optimize their energy consumption so they can save, they can drive efficiency, um, and then ultimately it can, as a result, um, increase the longevity of a plant's assets. So that's the, the first one. Um, the second has a, a bit of a different customer. So Brainbox AI is really focused on the building sector. And we didn't get too far into the details, Sean, but I, I think you know one of the largest emitting uh, sectors in Canada and globally are buildings. And so this, this company, Brainbox AI, is starting to think about how do you optimize energy consumption within those, those buildings? And it, it gathers data around energy flow around the building's profile, its operations, and it creates a profile for the building that then optimizes its energy consumption. Um, and so it can actually decrease the footprint of a building by about 20 to 40 um, percent. And it, yeah, it's huge and it's cool because it makes buildings self-operating as well. So there will be no human intervention required to optimize HVAC systems, for instance, which if you manage buildings, that's the biggest headache um, that we see. And then the final, the final company that I just want to highlight is Peak Power. So, you know, we've talked a lot today about movement from centralized to decentralized systems. Um, they, Peak has a software platform that enables customers to optimize that behind the meter energy storage system using EVs and batteries, which is kind of the point that you ended on. Um, so they, they're able to predict load and demand and, um, and realize cost savings for customers. So just a few that kind of give you insight into where we might be going. They're emerging, not kind of deployed at scale, but um, but that's where we're headed. That's really cool. I think one thing we haven't really talked a lot about today, and that is a big, um, a big consideration that should go into when you think about the electricity system is, we've talked a lot about how do you generate enough electricity, but uh, actually how do you conserve it before you generate it? Megawatts, as they call them, are usually the cheapest form of, of generation. And it's a big focal area for uh, Bullfrog as a sustainability solutions arm of, of Spark because we're in industrial facilities all the time. And so if somebody comes to us and says we're interested in solar, we'd actually say to them first, well, we actually have an energy management, uh, energy efficiency sort of solution for you too. So let's look at actually shrinking your, your demand and, and using it um, more intelligently before you start generating your own power. And it sounds like there's lots of interesting stuff going on uh, yeah. through your partners in that, in that sphere. Yeah, I think it's interesting, kind of use what you have. I know we're, we're at two o'clock. I do have one final question for you in 30 seconds or less um, from Bas Stratman who asked, what does Canada's future completely green grid look like? Maybe a, a quick kind of what's your gut reaction to that question? Right, well, I mean, future the future's a long time, uh, I'll say, so it kind of depends on which future you're talking about. But I think in, in a nutshell, what it looks like is, is a mix of many more distributed resources than we have today. So a lot more generation at local scale and uh, a lot more intelligence being provided to the grid to be able to manage that on a real time. There's probably more sharing between provinces than we have today to take advantage of the great assets that are there and help uh, those, those provinces that have high carbon footprints and have committed to lowering them to do that in the best, most economical way. And it's going to be a mix of many, many different kinds of resources. If you hear somebody say it's all about solar or it's all about wind, they haven't really gone through the, the complexity of it. I, I think it's we're going to need all of the above in order to get there. I think that's the perfect place to end. I want to be sensitive to time. Um, thank you so much for having me. Sean, what can we expect in terms of next steps? Right, so we've recorded this today, as you announced at the beginning, Kathleen. So uh, we'll share the, the link to the recording. If you want to share it with your colleagues or anybody who couldn't make it today, then please do so. Uh, and we're, we're working on uh, what the next in um, these, this webinar series might be. But uh, in the interim, I know we had a lot of questions probably come in that we didn't get to. So we'll have a look at those. And if there are any topics that we really didn't cover at all, then we'll try to get back to folks with answers on those as well.
That's great. Thank you everyone for taking the time this afternoon um, for hosting me for indulging my questions and hopefully I got to most of them in the chat. Um, thank you, Sean. Thanks a lot, Kathleen. Really great seeing you and uh, wish everybody a great afternoon. Likewise. Take care.